I'd just like to begin by thanking, first of all, um, so the support of the Department of Cultural Affairs, City of Los Angeles, and um, very much thanking Francisco, Lorena, and Yesenia for this talk today. We've the idea of labor of love is one aspect that's very much part of your practices, but we're also going to be talking about the bigger picture of the economics of pinata making, which I think this the idea of labor of love actually has uh, more ironic qualities to think about, um, and that it's much more the uh, labor of survival in a lot of cases. So that will be interesting to discuss. And you're all three coming at this from very different perspectives. So we're going to start today with Francisco Palmares, and he's going to talk about his practice, and um, which involves. Um, also his incredible fresh cart. So um, Francisco. All right. Well, thank you guys for joining me today. And uh, let me start sharing my screen. Um, share and then presenter. And Lorena and Yesenia, if you would mind um, turning your camera off for Francisco's presentation. OK, so. Um, Francisco Palomares. This is my art studio. I'm an East LA visual artist. I'm currently residing in the LA Arts District. So a little bit about me and my background. I'm a first generation Mexican American. My family is from Michoacan, Uruapan. And I grew up in East Los Angeles. Uh, what we're seeing here is a liquor store that I grew up around, Olympic Liquor in East LA. And this is all an oil painting. Uh, my education, it really started with rhyme and arts uh, as a high school student, which allows uh, high school students to take college level courses. At this time, I was going to USC. When I graduated from there, I went to California State University, Long Beach, got a BFA. And there I got the opportunity to really travel abroad, to continue studying art at Academia de Bella Arte, Florence, and Guangzhou Academy of Fine Arts in China. And then right here we have Rene Oyong Canvich, which is part of the Brotherhood series. And where uh, in my undergrad, I'm kind of figuring out what it means to be Chicano in a higher education institute. And just seeing and coming from East Los Angeles and going into college, all of a sudden I'm the minority, where in my community I was like the majority. Um, so here's Rene, a local Metro bus driver, you know, a hero to the immigrant people to get to work. Um, and so next, my artist statement, my work is a visual diary of my lived experiences as a first generation Mexican artist. I'm inspired by my East LA roots, the people, the language, and the places I grew up around helped shape my identity as a Latino and a Chicano. I have a strong sense of pride about the community I grew up in. I paint still lives, landscapes, and portraiture to document the American, the Mexican American experience. My, my main aim is to showcase the beauty in the Latino community and, and my Mexican heritage. I paint the beauty I see within our struggle to subvert the white gaze. I reject the images that limit our experiences to that of poverty, insecurity, and injustice. And this is a painting called Homage to My Mother's and where I'm reflecting on my background of sort of this labor, blue collar, uh, you know, the community that I grew up was janitors, cleaning homes, uh, janitorial services. And a few years ago, or several years ago, you know, learning from my mom and the way that she started small businesses, she started cleaning homes. And something that like throughout my youth, you know, like cleaning and then going into college, cleaning homes wasn't something that was seen as like high up, you know, it's like menial. And she's able, and she turned this small business of cleaning into a bigger business and is doing well for her. So I'm combining the world that I grew up in and the fine art world that I find myself, which is luxury and you know wealth. And so this is me combining both of my worlds into one. And so moving forward, uh, we have Agarate Papa, which is a oil on canvas, which is a, on display right now, Craft in America. And for me, overall, the theme of this is joyfully protesting of the status quo. And so uh, I'll go into the piñata. I paint large piñatas to create a literal elephant in the room. 
The piñata represents, the piñata's presence is unavoidable because I view the piñata as of a kind of a self-portrait. It also represents the conversations I want to see happen and these spaces that make people uncomfortable. Racial inequality, xenophobia, institutional injustice, and the impacts of gentrification. My education in the fine art world, which was heavily influenced by European art, the symbolism of the colorful, colorful paper, paper mache um, and cardboard piñata on a white sterile gallery walls is purpose, purposeful. It is a reiteration of the juxtaposition of me, myself, the piñata, and these unknown places when I went outside of my neighborhood and I became the outsider. Um, so part of the subverting the white gaze is acknowledging that as a Mexican American, my identity and spirit stand out whether I want them to or not. The moment I left my neighborhood for the first time to attend art classes at USC, I became the perpetual outsider belonging either here or there. Or there. So the piñata is in an unknown space, but joyfully is there, is smiling. So I'll do it sort of represent representation of myself. Uh, being a, a Chicano artist, I, uh, observing the Chicano artists that came before me during the Chicano movie movement, understanding the Chicano movement, learning from those artists, and then going into college and taking all that knowledge that I gather, that I learned as a youth, and now putting it back into my oil paintings where I'm a new generation. Um, with a different resources where I joyfully protest who I am just by being myself and just by living like my best life. Um, which leads me, which leads me to what I'm working on now, which is called Francisco's Fresh Paintings, in which I converted a fruit cart that became a mobile art gallery and art studio. And I and I take this mobile art gallery all around Los Angeles. So the central theme of this cart ties to a desperation to survive. You know, as a, I took a risk studying art and it's not a stable path. After graduating, I struggled like many of my peers to get into shows and exhibit. I was working at MOCA and barely getting by. So I, I, I felt really stuck. On my way to work on my route to downtown, I would see street vendors selling oranges and flores. And I thought about everything my mom did so we will survive and, and how we could make it. And not just my mom, just like my community of like, you know, people thinking like, I'm gonna put up a small little table outside of like this corner and start selling tacos or menudo. And we don't see it, but that's a small business and it's a hustle and it's they're entrepreneurs. So I wanted to honor the hustle I saw and I thought, wouldn't it be funny if I could make it in the fine art world by vending fresh fruit? So I, so I turned this carrito into a mobile art studio. Francisco's Fresh Paintings is a performance piece. I paint live while passerbys listen to my cumbias, while they per peruse through my fine art I have on display at affordable prices that every art collector can own. And so what I like to say is that in 30 minutes or less, you can take a fresh painting with you and might even still be wet on the surface, but it allows me to kind of take control of my own career and be able to find my audience directly and able to engage them and, and communicate with them. And when people uh, purchase a piece from me, it's like a connection I have with them. And so this fruit cart is very familiar. And most often people come up and they're th thinking I'm selling fruit, which I am. Uh, you're not like supposed to eat it, uh, but it will stay with you. And it's like an experiences. And it's just like the fruit cart, you know, when I think about growing up in East Los Angeles, the fruit cart was very much part of my identity as a Chicano. This is something that we have in our community and you know how to interact. And you might relate to the person behind the cart because it's like, that's like sort of like my uncle, my grandpa, and you speak with them in Spanish and you have this communication with them and they become a figure of the community. And, and so me going out, taking this cart, in areas that have been gentrified, like like the LA Arts District, I I I acknowledge that people don't even see that I, I'm protesting the status quo, and 
maybe somebody might see this car and maybe like oh that's just like another uh fellow folk uh just street vending trying to make a hustle but not understanding that i am college educated traveled you know about art history and taking this sort of very welcoming car very endearing and coming to engage not acknowledging that you know as we've seen through like current events that sometimes just the color of skin could be a protest but i flip that script and i joyfully protest that by just having this really fun experience for people to enjoy and so this is my overall encompassing of how the piñatas has led me into what i'm making now to survive as a fine art artist and turning this like whole medium of oil painting of what it means to be a painter, what it means to be a Latino artist, a Chicano in Los Angeles and trying to make my own space and trying to make my surroundings work with me and honor my Latino heritage and take it into a higher pedestal, into a higher tier. And then, and that's me and this is my contact info um if you ever want to reach out hire uh, francisco's first trainings um oh you could screenshot this and uh thank you for being here with me today thank you francisco so fun to hear your whole take on art as commodity and um you know i think it's part of this this conversation that opens up with thinking about pinatas and how they fall into that that um, spectrum as well, and the ways that you make art so accessible through your cart is. And then to add, you know, uh, going back to the piñatas too. To add to that, um, I source my materials like um, you know what you're gonna see later with Lorena. We we source our materials from the same area, which was like the wholesale district, piñata district, in downtown LA. Like you know, starting on Alam Alameda and Olympic. And where going into that area, it's like a cultural like experience on its own because you see not only people selling like piñatas and candies, but there's all of these items that you see from Mexico coming in that you probably won't find anywhere else. And then you see these items at wholesale prices that people are buying for their boutiques, for their shops, for their own events and kind of marking them up. And so, you know, like behind you, Emily, you know, one of Piñate y Dulce is, is be, behind you. And I'm turning, you know, this, this item that, you know, I bought for less than $5. I painted it into a large canvas and it becomes a lot. And now it becomes more than $5, you know? And so it's sort of the way that, and, and then, you know, you think of like, where's the dulce? Where's the candy? Well, you know, the candy's held inside and it's like a reflection, a symbolism of how, you know, my immigrant, immigrant Latino communities could turn something so like, you know, materials that are like paper and cardboard and turn it into something so more grander, right? We celebrate it, we enjoy it, and it's and and just the memory itself is so more invaluable. And it was only something so inexpensive. So for me, like my prized possession is this, this inexpensive material put into a higher tier in a canvas. Because once it's in a canvas, it becomes part of a larger conversation that, long, that lasts a lot longer, where a piñata is only supposed to last for like the event and then that's it and then you move on. But the memory stays there. The memory of that experience stays there. So I find it really interesting in how, you know, I could look at these these items that are so inexpensive in the Latino community, but have so much um, value in it, and what it is to our culture, to our community. And so that, that's kind of like how the piñata is in my artwork. Yeah, and I think that's the, the labor of, of love aspect that comes through that if we can rise above the economic issues that are impossible to deny that there is some intrinsic level that feeds all of this so um thank you and we'll revisit and i do want to mention um for everybody that 
that is here as far as questions, please type them up in the chat and we'll come to that. And then the artists are gonna have a conversation also at the end of these presentations. Um, okay, well, thank you so much, Francisco. We will talk more in just a bit. Um, next, we are going to hear from Yesenia Prieto. Um, I, I just wanna mention that all three artists today, today are presenting here in Los Angeles and are part of um, the art community here in LA and have uh, practices that I think are very distinctly tied with our particular um, urban culture in a lot of ways. And, um, and so, yes, thank you, Yesenia. You can unmute and turn your camera on and we will switch your presentation. Hi. Awesome. Hello. Well, it's a pleasure to be here, um, especially with these other artists. Um, it really, really means a lot. And thank you, Emily, for setting this up. Um, I can't even begin to express how much this means. Um, not only for me, but so many other um, struggling, aspiring artists I know that are out there that I, I feel like we all have something that we can relate to in this uh, current, like, economic environment. Um, so I will begin to start my little presentation here for you guys um, so you can get to know me a little bit more. Um, let's see if I can screen share this and bring you over here. And here we go. So again, I just want to thank you guys for being here. Um, even though, yes, I am a part of the ex exhibition. I also have a crew with me, so thank you for not only me, but everyone involved in the Piana Design Studio, including my father, my stepmom, my business partner, Mia Baez, my other crew member, Andrew. Um, we're a big family, and I think um, an important aspect to highlight is that we're not alone. Um, and in this labor of love, it is a mission for not only me, but everyone I'm connected to for us to help each other grow. And in turn, when we're helping each other, we wanna reach out to the course of the community to help the community grow as well. Um, Cause we're all in this together, you know? Um, life is short and I think appreciating each other in our struggle is, is important. So a little bit about me. Um, I am a third generation maker. I grew up in South Central Los Angeles. Um, if you see me, that is a baby of me <laughs> and my family. Um, uh, where I grew up and was born is called uh, the Piñata House in South Central Los Angeles. Um, and when I was younger, I actually didn't like piñatas. I was very intimidated by them. I thought they were scary. Um, there's a picture of me actually crying at this event because I was scared to hit the piñata. Um, but yeah, it was always a huge part of um, our celebrations because my grandparents, they started a piñata business. They were musicians from Mexico that came over and uh, they started a party supply store. They had the American dream in mind. They're like, we're gonna go to America and we're gonna make money and we're going to start a business and they chose to start selling piñatas and they actually met makers in Mexico and asked them to teach, like, can you teach me your craft? And um, they were taught how to make them and they brought them over, we're like supposedly, from what my tia says, we were one of the first families to bring piñatas over to LA in the 80s. Um, so it's been quite a journey, um, again, like, growing up in this, I didn't see it. I, I quickly learned that it was not like a glamorous industry. Um, most of the people that worked in uh, the piñata world were immigrants from what I saw and a lot of them only spoke Spanish. Um, I'd be running around like helping my tia and my cousins like would be like coloring in eyes and doing little simple tasks and just surrounded by piñatas all the time, every time I'd visit. Um, and yeah, I just, I never thought that I was going to be a part of it because 
again, like growing up in America, like I was second generation, like second generation in America, I would say. Um, I knew that I was like, okay, well, I'm getting an education and I'm going to pursue a safe career where I'm going to just focus on getting a lot of money. And that's that, you know, and I was like, yeah, that's, that's like, I don't know how to like even approach that. And it wasn't until I was 19 years old. Um, my father, he was like a sculptor and he's a fine art sculptor. And I used to be surrounded by his world too. So kind of just like seeing the difference of like the fine art world and the pinata world it was like so different yet both entities are creating and both entities are pushing the level. It's just that this pinata world, it's like there's no time to focus too much on the craft because you're in the hustle. You have to like make, make, make. My cousin used to always tell me, it doesn't matter how good you are, it matters how fast you are. And growing up around my father and seeing like the art aspect, he would take his, he would take his time. You know, he would, he would do all the proportions and the measurements correctly. And like, he would like always push the level of quality. And that's what he was supposed to do. Like as an artist, that's what you're supposed to do, you know? And my Thea, she reached out to me when I was 19 and she's like, Yesenia, um, what if you helped us in the business by, because I know you're an artist, because I used to draw a lot and I, I loved art as like a kid. So I thought, well, that'd be cool. Like, yeah, I would love to like help and like use vignettes as a medium to like, push the bar and, you know, do artistic things. Because in my perspective, like, piñatas are really beautiful when they are, like, treated as such, you know, like, as art. And my Thea was do starting to kind of do that a lot, meaning she would purposely choose certain color palettes to make the piece stand out more. She would explore different kinds of cutting techniques and traditional and new techniques for the piñatas to make them different. And, and then we start, she started getting more into like custom work and like started making anything that anyone ever wanted, like anything that you want, we can make. So we started getting people like coming with pictures, like, can you make this shape? Can you make this character? And constantly starting to understand that if we are going to be using this medium, um, it's challenging, you know, it's challenging. And there's a lot of different techniques and aspects that go into this. Um, so I, I was like, okay, I'm gonna help. I, I wanna help. Um, I was like, if I can take this as a young generation, as a Mexican American, somebody that is getting an education that knows fluent English, and has an artistic like sense, I can reintroduce this as what it should be, which is an art form, which I don't think people have seen as much back in the day, you know, especially starting out with the internet and e-commerce just emerging at the moment. Um, and then to my surprise, I kept hustling and boom, we started growing and I started branching out. Um, I actually went and in, I went independent and I started my own branch of the Pinata Design Studio. And I started working with all these different kinds of artists, um, young artists. Um, I'm, I'm 31 years old, just putting it out there. I'm not that young, <laughs> even though I look young. Um, and I started reach, uh, getting a lot of different kids coming in that were suffering from depression and anxiety. And like, they just needed like a creative like outlet. And me being me, I was like, any artist that wants to come in, like, come on, if you're an artist, like, that's what I need. If you want to join us, you can come volunteer. I can teach you the craft. And this craft is so multifaceted. There's so many different types of techniques. There's so many different types of mediums that we're using in terms of adhesives, in terms of like 
materials like tissue paper vinyl like we're messing with plastic we're messing with wood we're doing construction we're messing with photoshop and like graphic design like it's insane what how well versed in the art world you have to be to be a piñata artist and it's just so odd because i don't think it's very much appreciated or highlighted but when we, I started working with people and started teaching them, it became very well apparent because I'd run into like a really good painter, like a talented painter would come and be like, I want to help. I'm like, okay, let's do it. And I would like see like, okay, this is what you need to do. And even though they're very well worth first in painting, it's just like the pinata was still a very much challenging thing for them to create because you not only had to learn how to like paint and see visually, but you also had to know how 3D sculpture works. So it's just been really like an honor to be able to kind of have a, a platform to share uh, a different kind of experience with young artists. Um, I think it's certainly been a huge motivator to keep me going in this is seeing how much of a positive effect um, challenging people and artists um, has, you know, um, I think giving them an opportunity to create, help them kind of just like get out of the stress of the world and focus just for a moment on themselves and the peace in front of them. And as much as it is important to make money and all that, it's also important to put love into what you do for yourself. And in, I think one of the biggest blessings of the piñata is that this piece is going to create, and every piece creates so much happiness for everyone that's involved at the celebration. So um, yeah, again, to my next point of like, what we're doing and what we're trying to do is not only educate people and share our story, but we're in turn also raising the quality, raising the quality and, and showing people, look, I know that people don't understand what really goes into making these pieces, but we really do put a lot of sincere effort, just like any other art form into making these. Um, as you can see here, like, you know, the, sculpt the sculpture, the inner workings of the piece itself. Um, you know, there's blueprints involved, there's scaling involved, there's proportions involved. If we are going to do something for you, we are going to do it right. Um, because we pride ourselves in being the best version of ourselves that we can be. And as artists, that means we're gonna be the best artists that we can be for ourselves. And constantly elevating, constantly getting better and innovating, um, I think is extremely like number one on our list um, when it comes to not only just like for ourselves, but for other people, you know, like I think it's like important for human evolution, right? Be better. Why are you gonna be better? Well, because we have a responsibility to our previous generations, you know, if we're going to continue as humans, like it is our responsibility, but throughout every generation to grow, um, reach new platforms and continue growing, you know, otherwise we're gonna remain stagnant. And in the stagnation as a piñata artist in this industry would be a very, very sad thing to see. Um, again, touching on like, the capitalistic nature, um, I think a lot of the times people see Pinatas in the stores and they are only seeing a very, very unfortunate version of what could be. Um, not unfortunate, but just a version of what could be. Meaning you're seeing a piece unbeknownst to you probably and a lot of people, because I don't think it's very well known, but most of those pieces, every layer of tissue is laid on by hand, one piece at a time. It's cut by hand, one, and it's created and built and put together by hand. 
right? And then it's trans and it's built as fast as possible because you are only paid about like a dollar to two dollars per piece most of the time. Every piñata has different phases that it goes through, right? There's the construction phase, as you can see right here, and then there's the dressing phase and the decorating phase you come after. Um, and every person gets about a dollar for each phase that they work on. A dollar, two dollars, maybe four dollars sometimes on decoration and the piece itself is sold retail for around like 10 to 20 dollars, right? So the name of the game is how many can you make in an hour? It's not how many of, how much love and effort can you put into making this look beautiful? at the end. And that's what we're trying to do. It's like, if you take out the equation of trying to survive, of, of just creating as fast as possible, what would that look like, right? What would it look like to actually be able to put in time into a piece and showcase it in its most pristine form? Now, I'm not saying that all piñatas are not made like this, because they certainly are, especially in Mexico. If you go down there, you will see amazing, beautiful pieces. Um, and that brings me to where we're at now. This is kind of like what we're trying to do, is we're trying to push the bar and show what's possible. Grand scale pieces, intricate pieces, showcasing the actual interiors, you know, and being like, okay guys, if you really want, we can show you what it would look like if we were allowed to spend time on this and not have to worry about the struggle, you know? And there is still a lot of blood, sweat and tears because of course creating these things is not easy. It's very much extremely challenging. And, you, and that's the beauty of it though, that, that really is because again, to push yourself and to constantly be challenged means you're constantly growing and you're constantly learning and you're constantly adapting. And um, art has definitely given us or given me like a huge platform to excel. And I kind of see it like something I always say is Life is like art, right? Every piece that I get, every piece that I'm presented, someone says, can you make this for me? It's like this huge, okay, it's a huge 12 foot Jesus sculpture. I'm like, I have no idea how I'm gonna make that. I don't know what I'm gonna do. All I, and it's just this overwhelming idea, this overwhelming challenge and I, I don't, I'm just gonna say yes. I'm gonna, I'm, okay, I can do it. I don't know how I'm gonna do it, but I'm gonna figure it out. Okay, and that's where the hustle mind comes in. Like, okay, the hustle mind, you gotta do something. You gotta make the money, you know, you gotta survive somehow. So what do I do first? I'm just gonna start with the feet. I'm just gonna start at the bottom. I'm not even gonna think about how I'm gonna do the whole thing right now. I mean, I got the basic blueprints. I understand the basic roadmap and outline, but I'm just gonna start the bottom first. And just like life, like don't, you don't have to take on the whole thing all at once. It's just one small step first. You start with the feet, then you go on to the ankles, and you go on to the legs, and go on to the torso and every step of the way, almost every step of the way, I'm low key, like in my heart, freaking out. <laughs> I'm like, oh my God, am I doing this right? Oh my God, is this gonna turn out okay? Oh my God, I don't know, this is a disaster. And throughout <laughs> that process, surrounding me is my family and my crew and all of us just being like, it's okay, we got this. It's okay, keep going. Don't worry, like, we'll figure it out. Like, just keep going. Don't judge yourself right now. Like, it's not over yet, you know? And every time, once you reach the end, it's like, okay, I did it. 
<clears throat> the last decorations are on the face every time. It's like, all right, it's done. It's perfect. It's amazing. It's beautiful. I can't believe it. I did it. We did it. What? I didn't think that was possible, you know? Just like life, you know? You can get overwhelmed and you can think like, this is not, I don't know what I'm doing, you know? But if you just keep going and if you have that support and if you have people around you, you know, sharing their love with you, like, it helps a lot. Um, so, again, at the end, I think in these moments of strife, um, my main goal is to serve as an inspiration. I want to help people um, not be afraid to keep going. And I think that's my main like point to all this. Um, I'm gonna stop my screen share because I know I was like going on a little bit too long, but yeah, um, I just have to thank you guys so much. Um, but it does mean a lot because it's been so hard and pushing the bar and being okay with pushing the bar and seeing everyone else push the bar and be like, we can do this guys, we're in it together, <laughs> yeah? Don't be scared. If Mark Zuckerberg can make over a million dollars in a day, come on. <laughs> All right, anyways. You, you are so passionate and compassionate with your pinata practice and, um, and have pushed pinatas so far forward in terms of how they're viewed as art. So thank you, Yesenia. We will, we will hear more in a moment. Um, and you brought up so many important issues that um, I hope we'll have time to dig into more deeply. So thank you for all that you're doing. Yeah. Work. Um, I'm going to invite Lorena Robledo to join us now. Right. Her take on. Can you see me? Yes. Hi, Lorena. All right. All right. Start sharing images. Thank you so much. Thank you, Emily. And thank you, everyone from Craft in America. I wanted to tell you that had been definitely a hard work for you guys. And also I wanna tell the artists that I really appreciate all the passion and all the stories that we have shared because we all have similarities of how we conduct day-to-day -day business in this wonderful realm of the piñata. So Actually, my name is Lorena Robleto, and I'm the owner of Amazing Piñatas. I had been in the business for almost 10 to 12 years from beginning to this point, where I have actually came in the business, not because I planned, it just happened by accident, and I had to make it work. So... I was actually a stay mom, stay home mom, and I was helping my children throughout, you know, call, uh, school. And the time came when I decided that I wanted to get back at being a social worker. And my interest of the area of interest had been families and the well-being of children. So to being trained into that and having also the training on business. So I thought I could create a company on my own and become a business consultant. And by nature, I like, I enjoy talking to people and I really showed interest in knowing about other people. So I became friends with the family in the piñata industry in downtown the district. And I happened to walk one day to buying, I was going to buy, get some candy for Halloween. And I saw this gentleman counting a lot of money. And he told me, it's not going to the bank, it's going to the landlord. He said, I have to pay $25,000 a month for this lease. And I was shocked to see that and hear that. And I said, you know, if you can generate so much money, you're capable of making enough money to buy your own building. So 
he uh, to make the short story, he hired me and I became a consultant to his business. And we started changing things and guiding him about how to get a loan through the small business administration. And within that time, a building came on the market for lease which is very difficult to get in those buildings in Olympic Boulevard. And he said, you know, too bad I can't not get that building myself, but if you want to become my partner, we can lease that building and you can actually run your business from the top. And I said, you know, that sounds like a great idea. I think that I'm going to consider that. And I went to my husband who happened to be very conservative and he's actually, you know, has his reason for that. So anyway, so he gave me the green light. He says, if you wanna do it, we both can sign the lease agreement. And I was so happy. I said, you know, I, that was my dream to have my consultant firm. You, but within a couple of weeks, he gets notice from his wife who had been not feeling well that she has cancer and it was very advanced at that time. And so it was very dramatic. So he pulls out and I'm left on my own with the lease and all the responsibilities. So I didn't even tell my husband, I will go into the shower and I will start crying thinking, oh my God, what am I gonna do with this issue of this loan? I mean, I, I mean this building, how am I gonna do? So finally I said, you know, it has to work. I got to figure it out and I'm going to go into the retail and everybody's selling piñata. So that's the only option I have. So actually that's what happened. I, the, my friend or business partner gave me this bunch of hundred piñatas that he had made for, specially made for the business. So I started with some candy and piñatas and the rent was almost, 7000 over $7,000 a month at that time, which was a lot of money, you know, I thought. So we had to make it work. And I started getting clients and I would take the time to explain them how things were done. But throughout this time, I started getting to know the families that were making these wonderful piñatas. And like Jasenia said, it broke my heart when I learned that some of these people were making $2 because she will explain that it goes through the faces, you go through the structured, and then you go to the, um, the structured and then you put the paper mache with the, the starch and after that is the dressing and decoration. So you go through all these stages and each stage that they make, it's probably $2 to 50, a dollar 50 to put the, paper mache and wrap it with the cornstarch and then dry in the next step. So if somebody makes piñata from their home, it will be probably the most that they can make as profit, maybe a couple of dollars. That's the most on each piñata. But when I hear this, I'm thinking, oh my God, this is not, this is horrible to know that this is happening right here in one of the most powerful country of the world. And we are actually seeing this exploitation. And I'm thinking, you know, I, at that time when I learned that, I just had that connection. And I said, I gotta make things for these people to realize that they have the wonderful skills and we can build anything from it. And if we, I'm able to make this a large company where I can even bring childcare, some of these people that actually need it. You know, I can do health coverage. We can do all that So I'm thinking, and how can I come up with this right recipe where I can have everybody will be happy and I feel comfortable, you know, charging what is fair that they will cover livable wages for these people it will give the best product to the consumer, you know, and I will also make a fair profit, you know, because I'm after all, I'm in the business and I care to make some profit. So, but I wanted to make it where it is 
balance. I just don't want to be able to feel like, okay, this is, I'm interested in just making the profit and I don't care. That, that wasn't me. I'm thinking like, how can we help these people to realize the value that they have in their hands and they can provide and move to a next level and keep growing. So that's how I started seeing things. And I said, you know, hmm. I had some of my first custom orders and like I can relate to Jesenia also because some of the people would tell me, oh, you're crazy. You cannot take that order. They're gonna sue you, you know, all this. And I'm thinking, yeah, you know, I can make it. We can make it. And somehow I have taken orders, like have no idea how we're gonna do it. But eventually at the end, everything comes into place. And one of the most difficult areas that I have deal with has been reliability. And that is something that it's been very difficult. And once I used to be like more like upset at, from the business owner, like, oh, they're not so responsible. But once you start looking through all the layers of the social, issues and economic issues that they are subjected to, you realize, Jesus, you know, it is so difficult and yet they're surviving, they're making it happen. And it would be up to me as a business owner to figure out a solution where I can, probably I can keep some of the people that I work with, they're artists and they're beautiful, creative, but not all of them are responsible and not all of them are willing to acknowledge that there is a lot of problems that they are facing with the drug addiction and alcohol. And that is something very close to my home in a sense, because I have dealt with a, in the social service field that's been a problem, like we all know, we have problem with drug use, but particular in this segment that I'm referring to, because such a low, I mean, the low pay that they get, you know, per unit. So they have to find the energy. Somehow they need to figure it out, how am I gonna have to build 40, 50 piñatas, the structures a day, so I can make enough to support my family. So they get, they become, dependent on math. And I've seen that across most of the families, very few people, few families that I have come across have not been touched by the disease of uh, some substance abuse. And has been across some of the families where you find not only perhaps the math, youth, or alcohol, but once they start taking math, and then this is, you know, sounds uh, terrible, but most of the families that I have worked, like I said, only two or three probably had not been touched, but the rest had been, and yet I thought I was, you know, pretty able to identify someone under the influence, and to tell you the truth is so subtle, that I have people, you know, using it and we were not even aware of how that was happening. And once I started looking into it, I, I was shocked to see how much abu abuse is going on on the drugs. And I'm thinking it's not because they are like people that they need to have the drug and they're really corrupted or they have an issue. But basically, some of them just get into that math because they want to have the energy to make things happen for their family. And they just fall into this trap of, of the drugs use, which leads them to being caught into the influence, and they deported. It's just and revolving doors for them. You know, they get um, um, arrested, they go back to Mexico or Guatemala or Nicaragua. So, but I have, you know, people coming from different countries, but basically the most 
um, people that the best artisan do come from Mexico. We have people from Guatemala. That's a different type of art that they do with the piñatas. But what I'm, what all they have in common, it is the need to find their energy and the strength so they can perform. And like Francisco was saying, it is very difficult to believe for some people from us that knowing that there are cardboard outside and they can really buy some corn starch and make this paste and make their piñatas because it's available. It's really easy to get all this material and the talent is there. And I'm thinking, wow, you know, if we can bring them to another level, perhaps they're not gonna need the need to perform and be able to do so quickly because they will be compensated for the piece, for the art that they do and not just the amount of, of production. And that's what really we go back to Jesenia. That is exactly no time to put into the piece because they have thinking, I gotta have roof and food on my table. So there's no nothing else that I can take time to improve this because I have the responsibility of feeding our family. That's what they go through their mind. But once they have the opportunity to work, you know, like I made a, a conscious decision that I want to pay them double, three times, whatever that it takes, because to me, the person has the value and they can do the work, but they also need to be paid what's fair. So when I do that, I already teaching them like, let's move to the next level and you are able to earn so much money. And they become more like, yeah, I can do this and I can move to the next level. I can, they have more like self-respect and you treat them like, you know, we are artists and I bring that up, you know, and they, they, they feel like, wow, you know, I never felt this way before that he said, you know, some of my staff had said, because I always thought there will be art that is gonna be disposed, but now I know that, you know, I can use it at a different level. So that gives them the hope and the opportunity to move out some of that trap that they feel like, well, oh, there's nothing much because if I ask for more money, then I'm gonna purchase the product. And that's what we see a lot in the Olympic you know, and I have faith that, especially now that we have going through this pandemic and we've seen so much people staying home, I will often think of them, you know, a lot of the people that stay home, especially that undocumented, because to tell the truth, you know, most of the people that had worked under the circumstances do not have the proper document. And because of that, they have resources that they create the work for themselves to be able to sustain. So I think that we have to think, and for those who are listening, I think I'm reaching out to you to share this information with other people and make them know that there are faces behind those piñatas that you see, beautiful colors, that there are families that, it takes a whole family to finish one piñata so they can sell it. And, and, and so if we share this information and think of the children too, because most of these are young families working hard and they send their children, they, bring, they come here to look, pursuing the American dream. But at the same time, you know, it's such a demanding and the despair is so huge about the haves and not have that it is unfair to think that we can have these people perform at certain level and not be able to um, be impacted by, by the lifestyle that they have, the environment that they have, you know, so when we think in going back to this, this experience that we just have going through, having all these children at home, think of they lost transportation because they don't have anyone to in the bus. They lost 
the ability to socialize because they don't go to school. They live in very small areas, small rooms with relatives. Uh, they lost education because the education that almost a whole year. So let's think about how as individual we can reach out, perhaps some of the schools and, and reach out and offer it. You know, it could be whatever is possible for that person or, or your friends to reach out and say, we can do this for our children, for these children. And maybe in education, maybe a kid that they will learn more or books or I'm just thinking what best suits you between your family, friends, but I think that we can start small and make reach out to some of these families. Lorena, the way that you bring uh, your social social work past and that the sense of community understanding that you bring into your work as a, as the owner of a piñata making business as a piñata maker, as an artist is, is so incredible. I would like to, um, cause we're wrapping up here um, and I believe Francisco won't be able to join us for too much longer. I just wanted um, to give everyone a chance to see if you have, if, if you have questions, people who are with us and um, Yesenia as well, if I uh, join us again, but all of you, you know, the, the, I think there, you, you've all touched on this aspect of piñatas that, um, is very misunderstood that people mm -hmm. commonly think that they are machine made and don't mm -hmm. put faces behind um, the makers of pinatas. Uh, mm -hmm. people, that there are people making these um, and that they are made by hand. I think that's such an important point. What, yeah, what, what else can be done really to educate customers? I think, um, you know, you're, you, Lorena, you're doing so much in terms of thinking about the makers and trying to um, to change their circumstances. Uh, what else needs to happen as far as the consumers and those of us on, on this side of the equation? You know, I, I usually tell them, I said, you know, let's think of this, put yourself, how long will it take you to make something similar to this. And then once you start taking them through the process, they realize like, wow, you know, you're right. And I, I will explain, I said, you know, I see a lot of people, they think that handcraft, especially in the third world countries, we think that handcraft is less than while you have, you know, the major, the most progressive countries, powerful handcraft is very expensive because of the labor, which is not what had seen. So there is also that conflict that we see like, okay, so do you come and think like, oh, it's just, you know, it won't take that much to make that. But once you start putting yourself into part of it, you realize, you know, it, it's very involved, very involved. So it's educating. It's educating mm -hmm. what you all really started to do. Yeah. And, educating, um, I think, and appreciating too. Like, if you don't have a complete understanding, appreciate that you don't have the full picture mm -hmm. and trusting that these people, when they are telling you and approaching you, like, hey, this, yeah, this took a lot of time. So, this is the price point that it is because this is, you know. America like no one we're not no one's trying to rip anyone off you know I think mm -hmm. if we as a community understand that we are in this society together in this capitalistic society together surviving together being honest and, and true you know like I mm -hmm. when I say this is a hundred dollars I'm not saying that because I want to make a bunch of money and just come up on top and I'm just saying that because like I want the people that works with me to be able to have food on the table to eat you know like and that's basic basic needs it's not even extravagance like we're not like over here spending money on new iPhones or anything like that we're like focusing on basic how do we pay the rent how do we get food on the table how do we pay for gas money you know like mm -hmm. if we can just get people to understand that like as a community, like we do really rely on each other because like as we see with COVID and the government and these politicians running amok, like it's, they're not, our society isn't very helpful towards us, I don't think. And depending on, I don't know, 
someone to come save us, it's, it's not going to happen. I think it's just us understanding and being real with each other. And mm -hmm. I don't know, appreciating each other more. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's important as a consumer, like get to know the maker, but really know the maker, you know, like on a real level, like, hey, how's your day today? It was, it was crazy, it was stressful, you know? But little things like that, I think are important. It's just having a real connection. Like we are humans and, you know, and there's very limited time here for us. And um, I think recognizing that as a consumer too is important. You know, it's a very transitory experience. And what are you going to do with that transitory experience? Yes. And I mm -hmm. think, um, yeah, and I don't know if Francisco, you have a final comment, but yes, you, you know, your work is art as commodity and, um, mm -hmm and shedding light on the issue of entrepreneurship, certainly um, your, your final thoughts of, of, you know, experiences of when you do your kind of interventions into it with your cart in different locations, how you educate people that way. Um, I would say as a consumer, just pay for what the artist is asking for, you know, and uh, build that relationship with the artist, you know, um, or the individual. <laughs> They're, they're charging you because that's what's going to allow them to survive. Um, you know, when you see people doing these jobs out there, it's like, you know, when I'm outside street vending, I'm vulnerable to the public, to everyone, to how people are going to respond to me. Uh, you know, fortunately, I have a good, good experiences, but that's because of how I invite the viewer into my space, into the installation. And, you know, I think presentation makes a lot of a lot of effort because when people see my prices, they don't really ask why they're that price, and you know, and it's sort of like this is what it is, and and I have it at these prices, and I don't know if I really explain why they're that valued. You know, it's like you don't ask why an iPhone costs that much. You know, have you, you don't. Have you ever um, taken the card into a different, you're generally in the arts district. Um, I've taken it to different areas and it has different responses. You know, I've taken it to areas where fruit vendors are not welcome. And you could tell that by not being any kind of street vendor on the street. And so in those spaces, I'm like an anomaly because they're like, I'm kind of programmed to just automatically ignore you. I don't even know why, but when I see your fruit cart, it's, some, it's an item that I don't necessarily interact with. But when I see art that you're selling art, it's like a twist, but because the way that you're presenting it has been such a model that it's been to ignore that they don't interact. When other places where they see a fruit cart and they're like, oh, I know how to interact with that. And then the fact that there's a next level to it, uh, it's like interesting, entertaining. Um, and so when it goes to pricing, I make them, I have my own equation, I have my own, and I have different price points. And I'm not really there to like justify what my prices are. I'm there to give you the experience. And, and I think right where, where it does, you know, it helps for the consumers to, you know, shop locally to, uh, you know, get to sh shop locally, right? um to to pay what they're asking for but it's also really important for the the makers to understand their value i i, I think more is like understanding the value and, and and knowing financial literacy as a business person to be able to put yourself out there and and then if someone tries to lowball you to be like no and move on to the next person because what you're making is unique right uh it is unique in itself because it's handcrafted and you know I just keep moving keep pushing it so it's uh I'm not really there to uh give you an explanation what my pieces are I'm there to share like this is a re unique thing you came to get this from me you came to my community to get this you won't find it anywhere else so this is what it is and I, and I think it's more importantly to educate those that are selling vending like this is your value and this is how you like market yourself mm -hmm. yeah um rare for art to be the model for economics <laughs> um but i think there's a lot to be learned from you know applying that art model to to the pinata world so um 
I think we should probably close because it's 1208. We've only barely touched the surface, um, not just on this issue, which obviously has so many other implications, um, but on what each of you do in terms of your uh, businesses and practices. But I hope this was a bit of a taste of that. And there's so much more to learn about each of you. And we invite you all to, to dig dip deeper into, um, into Lorena's work, Yesenia's work, Francisco's work. And I thank you all for being so outspoken about all these in incredibly important issues that are wrapped up into what you are each doing. So thank you. And thank you to everyone who joined us. Thank you. Today. Thank you so much. Thank you.